Do I feel my potential is being met? Do I feel set up to succeed in all the ways that I want to succeed? Do I have the energy to take on my day? Do I feel good in my skin? Um, that's really what Eat Your Heart Out is all about. Magnesium Breakthrough is my favorite magnesium supplement. Click the link in the description to save 10%. Let's jump right in talking about where your passion for health and wellness stems from. My passion stems from probably a feeling of just potential. Like I think when you invest in your health, when you feel really good in your skin, you approach every day differently. And it is a, it feels very empowering to know that it's something that you that you actually do have, uh, you know, obviously there are th- genes and, and external factors and things that make it feel like it's out of your control, but food, which is obviously where I live and breathe, feels like one thing where um, even small investments end up yielding big rewards. And certainly my effort is always to, you know, put a, a, a priority on health, but not an obsession. My obsession is taste. <laughs> so to try to make that pursuit of health as delicious as possible and fill your life with really, you know, for me, those memorable moments are those family gatherings around the dinner table and, and sharing and breaking bread with friends. Um, and the idea that I can savor those moments and have that delicious filling up my memory bank and also be doing something to hopefully prolong my vitality and help me live the life that I dream of. That, that is, um, that is something really exciting. So when it comes to health and wellness and this different way of thinking about things than obviously, you know, conventional diet and, and lifestyle, can you think of like a climax point if you go back into childhood when things started to change for you and click in a different way? Yeah, I mean, I think now, um, I think this is more sort of commonplace knowledge, but I think back when I was growing up, a lot of people, I think, were under the misguided notion that information changed behavior. And I think what we've now seen with the, you know, the explosion on the internet of so much information about how to take good care of ourselves and how to eat and how to live and how to have good habits and all these things. And lots of people who still don't totally subscribe to all of them. It is not information that drives change. It's emotion. And it's finding a way to really incorporate new information or incorporate existing information you already have at your fingertips into a lifestyle that genuinely doesn't feel like work. I, I feel like we, um, a lot of, I mean, we all crave vitality. We all crave, uh, you know, clear glowing skin, bright white eyes, weight loss or, or weight maintenance, just like feeling really strong and solid in our bodies. Um, but I think a lot of the lifestyles that guide us that direction can feel like another job. They just are, they're complicated. They're complex. They seem opaque. They seem sometimes arbitrary in the rules that they make. And something that I really strive for is, intuition in the way that I consume anything, but also, but especially in the way that I nourish my body and nourish my family. And, um, so for me, it was actually when I was in high school, up until the time I was in high school, I was a really overweight kid in a family full of health nuts. And that was sort of the the first moment when I started to realize it's not just information that's going to help me make better choices because I had information at my fingertips. I was lucky growing up in a medical family that I had access to the best of Western medicine, but I also had this incredible dichotomy being presented and, and not even, they're not, they're not they're, they're not even two sides of the same coin. They're, they're just different avenues for treating the same issue with my mom and my grandma who were deeply into nutrition and, and, um, complementary medicine and treating wellness as a whole. Um, and so I had this beautiful, you know, dual, uh, influence of those two modalities and, Um, it wasn't until I got to college that I really was able to harness that information that I was so lucky to get to grow up with. And because remember at that time, you know, yes, the internet was around, I'm not that old, but, um, but it wasn't the same way as it is now where it just feels so like, like everything's at your fingertips. Um, and it was in college that I realized, um, you know, I'd been researching a lot about, uh, childhood and adolescent nutrition and wellness for, um, I was helping my parents to, craft the curriculum for the original iteration of Health Corps, which is a nonprofit my family started back in 2003. Um, and I was just, it was, you know, working with a, a, a variety of nutritionists, dietitians, et cetera, but helping just to try to make it digestible for kids my age. And so I'd had this great informational sort of download. I felt like I was in the matrix, you know, they like plugged it in. I got the download, but um, it wasn't until I got to college that I realized First of all, that college is such a unique experience that had not yet been addressed from the standpoint of someone currently living in that time period. 
of our lives. And I knew that on the one hand, I really wanted to savor, you know, the, the college experience and go to the keggers and the pizza parties and meet friends and hang out and do all the things that, that, um, that are sort of part of the social experience of college where food really does come to play, but also lose the weight I was carrying around that I did feel was holding me back in my life and do it in a way that still allowed me to maintain my full-time love of food. And it was being in that sort of first um, experience of, you know, true freedom and personal responsibility that I was able to start to create, you know, here's an easy swap I can make at the cafeteria. Here's how to make my own salad dressing at the cafeteria and always have it on hand so I can have a big healthy salad to start my meal. And then if I want to have a side portion of the mac and cheese or the fried chicken or whatever it is that's tempting me, I never feel deprived, but I also am not filling up on the thing that isn't fueling my body. And it was just little flips like that that started to help me create what eventually became my first book, The Dorm Room Diet, which was all about creating a healthy lifestyle program that really works for college students. And that was, you asked about a light bulb moment. I think the light bulb moment for me was A, it really works. And, and seeing, you know, be, being able to lose the weight, being able to feel confident and strong in pursuing a goal and, and, you know, reaching towards it, but also in, um, the community that I started to build at that point, because I will tell you as a kid who, I always loved adults. I was never particularly comfortable with my peers. I definitely had a shy bone. And imagine going on book tour for a book about weight loss where you had to talk to exclusively your peers. You know, I remember presenting at like Panhellenic societies across America. And it just, I would look out at this room of hundreds of people my age and they weren't judging me. They weren't you know, laughing at me. They weren't embarrassed for me. They were learning from me and they were feeling supported by me and they were taking little, you know, swaps or trades or, or, you know, ways to navigate the danger zones that I was talking about. And I could see it, the light bulbs happening in their eyes of like, oh, wow, this, this feels very usable to me because she's living a very similar life to what I'm living right now as an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old. Um, so lots of little light bulb moments about the way that we make health valuable in our life. But I feel like that was a big moment for me of, of transitioning from information based health only to really applicable emotional based health. Well, it's really interesting. That's the time when you made the shift because, you know, you're away at college and you actually lost 40 pounds within two years. And this is a time of, you know, independence, a lot of, you mentioned the cafeteria, a lot of junk food, stress, <laughs> busyness, yeah. studying. So you know, coming from this environment where you're at home and you had this influence, you mentioned your grandma and your mother who, you know, had this alternative way about them. It's interesting for you, it would click at that time and you transition during what would, from the outside in, look like a difficult time to transition. Well, yeah, well, I mean, I think, look, freedom is interesting in that way because you can you 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 have no guardrails in many ways when you get to college and you are given i i will re, i will always remember the feeling i had of like going you know whatever waking up in my dorm and realizing that i could buy a snickers bar every day of my life if i wanted to if i wanted to have that like the idea that uh, you know all of these things were constantly available and not taboo and not off limits and just that like clicking of realizing that you have control, the food doesn't have control over you was a really important shift for me. And I think it's why to this day, I don't believe in restriction. I don't believe that, um, you know, really long term that, that humans should be in a position of feeling like food controls our lives. It really, you know, it's, it's supposed to be fuel obviously, but it's supposed to be pleasure. And I think that, um, I think removing that taboo and making sure I felt like I was the one in the power in the driver's seat really was fundamental to being able to harness that freedom as a as an opportunity to create really good you know lifetime habits of health as opposed to feeling like I was um at the whim of like, oh, this bag of chips showed up at my friend we were watching you know at that time twenty four was like the biggest show on TV and we would I remember we would have viewing parties every Monday night and everybody would, you know, grab, gather around a huge pile of, of delicious, but junk food. And, um, and I never wanted to think of myself as like not being able to participate in that. So I just brought, like had a little bowl or had a little cup, put the, the, what I, the quantity I was comfortable with in that bowl and ate from that. So it's not like a mindless transaction. I think that mindlessness is something that, look, when you're really busy or you're stressed or you're celebrating or everyone around you is doing something, it's very easy to change your 
Um, it's very easy to not listen to what your body or even your mind is actually telling you. And I think that that just like that momentary reminder of my own consciousness in the choosing um, was also very helpful. And before you got to that point in college, when you did lose the weight, was there a lot of different diets you tried through your teens, a lot of yo-yo dieting? And, and what did that experience look like? Well, you talk about being easily influenced. I mean, you're a teenage girl growing up in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was, uh, I mean, think about like the idyllic body at that time was not curvy. It wasn't, you know, that was not the, the, the sort of poster girl put up on every ad campaign and every magazine cover. Um, and so it, it, there was, I mean, all of my friends and I were always, I can, I can't even remember all the names of these crazy things we would try and we would like, you know, do it together and all this stuff. And it was so, um, misguided because that's a time at which, first of all, your body obviously needs the nutrition to function well in school, to perform at your, at your, you know, top caliber. But I also think, um, it really does distort your, your confidence. It, it breaks down your ability to love your body if you're constantly like hyperanalyzing and trying to lose weight and the whole deal. Um, and also it was really boring. Like I love to eat and I love to cook and the idea of, you know, boiling six eggs and having that be like your big thing you were going to eat throughout the day was so bad. So yeah, it didn't work. Did not. And, and by the way, it also really didn't work because even if you lost weight in that primary sort of um, moment of joining the program and sticking with it, it all came back. The minute you went back to whatever food or random food group was off limits in a given a diet, it just, it came flooding back. So to me, that was just, was never going to be a, a, a sustainable solution. Well, I'm sure a lot of people tuning in right now can relate where they've tried different diets, tried different lifestyle modifications, and you know, maybe it works for a bit, but it's not a long-term solution. So what I'm curious about, and just hearing you share your story a little bit there, it sounds like for you, it was nothing radical when it finally worked for you. It was just moderation. So you would have maybe, I think you mentioned there when when your friends were eating chips, you'd kind of have less. And I'm just curious, is there anything more to that? Was it just moderation? Was it was it cranking up your exercise? What other changes worked for you, you know, at that I time? Think, I think humans always really thrive in routine. And I think when I felt like I was really strongest, which was very important to me, I didn't, I didn't just want to get thin. I wanted to feel really good in my skin. And it was when I would wake up pretty much every, now granted you're in college, you have very low, like low other demands on your time. I didn't have kids. I didn't have a husband. I didn't have work. I didn't, I mean, you know, you're showing up and going to classes so I could make time to work out every day, but in a very moderate way. Like I was not, um, I, I literally, I did the elliptical or the Stairmaster probably five days a week, um, maybe for half an hour, 40 minutes, like what I could squeeze in in the morning. Um, because you know, you also hit snooze a few times, but, the, but in the food realm, um, it really was, it was a couple different things. Number one was what I described with like the salads, for instance, I realized that I would never have to say no to indulgent food moments and savoring that experience. If I didn't try to make that food, the thing I filled up on. So I really would invest in having a big salad at lunch and at dinner. And then I would have side portions of the things that were like the temptation items that I, you know, I mentioned the mac and cheese and the, and the fried chicken, but you know, whatever it was, um, I don't even remember what our cafeteria, we had a beautiful salad bar, which was, we were lucky to have that, but I don't remember what the other hot options were, but I pizza, like I remember wanting to know that those things were available to me if I wanted to have them. And it's not one or two bites that sends you over the edge. It's, eating a cookie, feeling so guilty for eating the cookie that you eat the rest of the package of the cookies thinking you're never going to eat a cookie again. Like it's just, it's that kind of mental trip that we take ourselves down that I think really does create the problem long-term. Um, so when I could remove the guilt of like, I really feel like a piece of pizza tonight. So I'm going to eat that pizza, but I'm going to eat it after my salad. And by the time you get to your pizza, you're kind of like, well, the first bite tastes amazing. This, I, I actually developed something I called the two bite rule when I was at the Chew, which, cause look, I was surrounded by incredible, delicious food every day, multiple different courses of it. So I, I, um, I basically created the first bite was a chance to explore what's on the plate and savor that moment. The second bite was to like dive deeper on something I really loved and ab about that taste or, uh, original. And I, realize that after the second bite, pretty much every other bite's going to taste the same. So then the question just becomes like, do I want more? Do I not care about having more? And that, um, that really has helped a lot in terms of just long-term, like I never say no to things I'm craving when I can rely on that, that sort of, 
uh, you know, not eating from, a, not eating when I'm super hungry and it's what I'm filling up on, you know? And I think, um, I think that that really helped a lot and little, you know, little swap outs definitely made a difference. I mentioned the salad dressing. I mean, that's a, that's one thing that so many of us blindly reach for prepared dressing just because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're making, we're having a salad. That's the even worse part of it is like, you think you're doing something great and then you get the package of blue cheese dressing and you might as well have had a hamburger, you know, it's, um, so I, I, making my own salad dressing was something I started doing very early on in, in, um, in the dining hall and, um, and then realistically, just, you know, I, I outlined sort of five danger zones as part of that book, places where it was really easy to let good, good habits fall by the wayside. Um, things like, you know, eating, eating, um, late at night when you're studying and under a lot of stress, going to parties and things of that nature, you know, d- d- sitting around in the dining hall and eating multiple meals just because people, like new waves of people kept coming in. Um, and I, I, you know, I kind of, strategically went through how to navigate those zones in a way that like you never feel deprived, you never feel hungry, you never feel like you can't participate in the experiences that really matter, but you're not doing it blindly without some kind of game plan to set yourself up for success. In your first book, we talked about this quickly, your mother and your grandmother being into alternative health. You talk about how your mother was at least a vegetarian and she was into Reiki. I'm curious, growing up, was that a diet that you played with at all? Was this something that, you know, has come and gone over the years or is that just not of interest? No, I was primarily vegetarian all growing up, pretty much until I got to college. Um, and I, you know, my mom obviously being an incredible cook and also the main cook for our family, um, really, you know, made, still made a lot of fish. You know, our family ate a lot of fish, um, but oh, not for her. I sh- this is, this is tricky. My mother is strictly vegetarian and has been since the early 70s uh, when her mother took all six of her children vegetarian, some of whom have backpedaled from there, some of whom are still the way. Um, and they're sort of like all around, you know, pescatarian, et cetera, kind of things. Um, but my mom is strictly vegetarian. Our family did eat a decent amount of fish, but also... I grew up with this like celebration of vegetables, this celebration of all the different flavors and textures and things you could create with vegetables and grains and legumes. Um, So that was really exciting because we never got stuck in a rut of like we're eating the same thing over and over or we're relying on meat to be the focal point of a plate. And when you're dealing with vegetarian items for a husband, in her case, who had not grown up vegetarian, had not anticipated that, uh, you have to keep it really interesting and exciting. And then I, I, you know, periodically, um, you know, I would have meat sometimes when we would go out to dinner or something like that. I was never particularly dogmatic about it. It just wasn't on the dinner table very often. And then when I got to college was when I, again, as part of this sort of healthy pursuit, um, one of the healthiest options the dining hall had was chicken breast. So I would eat a lot of grilled chicken breast and, um, it's really nice with a piece of melted cheese on top. It's quite delicious and juicy. And uh, and so anyway, I, I sort of, you know, at that point in time, very clearly was not vegetarian. And I, because of the the beautiful path of work that I've chosen, it would be very hard to be restrictive with, um, you know, with, with like too rigid a way of eating. I try to eat a bit of everything, but I still have a major preference on, I mean, just the way I naturally create my plate. It's always a huge amount of veggies. Um, and then protein, I would always rather have a smaller portion of really good quality um, than the other way around. What about intermittent fasting? This is such a popular topic these days in the health and wellness space. Is this something you've played with throughout the years or something you delve into now at all or no? No, sadly, it's not, maybe not sadly, I don't know. For whatever reason, it's never really been the thing for me. I, um, I'm someone who actually wakes up pretty hungry and I feel like I, you know, I don't, I can, I I could not eat, have breakfast, but like breakfast isn't the place where I have a particularly big issue. <laughs> so, um, but I've seen, you know, lots of people rave about it. it. It's just my, my personal feeling is that you have, and you know, obviously I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a dietitian, but I do feel like to going to the point of my desire to have intuitive eating be a big thing I can rely on. I found that on the days when I would, for whatever reason, not eat until lunch, um, a, I was famished by the time I got there. So like whatever I was choosing to eat probably wasn't as consciously chosen as it could have been. Um, and also I feel like my body kind of would go into, and I don't know if this is, um, I, I, it was such a limited sample size and so not done over like an extended period of time. So I feel weird even saying this, but I felt like my body 
was not going to be burning fuel as effectively as it could just by virtue of the fact that it felt like I didn't get anything all day. I better hold on to this kind of thing. Um, I'm also not that happy a person when I haven't eaten something. So it doesn't, it's not my thing, but, but, um, but I see it work for so many people and I know, so, I mean, what's, what's craziest to me is the number of like the, the amount of different things people have said, have, they've healed through, you know, intermittent fasting or paleo or like any of these sort of, um, you know, ways of prioritizing healthy. And I guess with intermittent fasting, it, there the sort of premise there is like, it doesn't even matter what you eat if, as long as you're only eating within eight hours of the day. I, it seems fascinating to me. It's, it hasn't been something I've really subscribed to though. Well, you're also going through a unique time of your life with four young kids at home, which I'm sure breakfast is a big thing. And It's and, a huge thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, no, but I mean, breakfast, we also, it's like one of the, you know, especially when I'm traveling for work or or away at night, like breakfast is something we rely on as a big family moment. We're all together. Um, you know, my kids are little, eight, six, four, and two. So a lot of times they're eating dinner at 4.30 at night anyway. So it's, bless you. So it's, it doesn't feel like, um, the moment when, when I like, I don't want to cut breakfast out. I want to sit and have breakfast with them, or even I'll just have a coffee, honestly, with them for early in the morning. And then after they go to school, I might try to get a workout in, and then I'll end up eating breakfast probably at like 11 ish. Um, but I also, it's, it's a time when they see me hanging out in the kitchen a lot too. And I, and just by virtue of, of being around food, I feel like it makes you hungrier also, (laughs) you know, it's not like you're just piecing out and being busy all morning and then, um, and then realizing you're hungry at lunchtime. And again, as a mom with young kids, how involved do they get in the kitchen? And has that been part of your success in introducing them to new foods and getting them to eat, you know, in a healthful way? I'm really glad you didn't say, do they like to get in the kitchen and help? Because I feel like whenever someone says that, I'm like, well, it wouldn't qualify as help, but they do. They love to be in the kitchen and they love to make a mess and they do help, but it's, you know, everything is like a longer process when they're here, obviously. Um, We're actually in my kitchen right now. Um, Look, I, I grew up, my love of food and my willingness and desire to be experimental and adventurous with food was so much a feature of the fact that I grew up in the kitchen. Like I was always at my mother or my grandmother's elbow, you know, ta- sprinkling things into the pot or watching what they were doing, listening to what they were talking about. It was the happiest, most wonderful place for our family to bond. Um, and I desperately want that for my kids too. I want not just the confidence around food and the, and the willingness to experiment and adventure through food that I had but also the family memories, the, the, like, oh, my mom would always make this thing on, you know, on birthdays, on celebrations or every Friday night we had, like, I, I am becoming very sentimental about, you know, traditions and things that kids hold on to as, as tent poles in their childhood. And I do think just being in and around the kitchen is a feature of that. Um, and certainly my older two like think they're hosting a YouTube cooking show and I'll record them so that I like, don't put it up anywhere, but they love it. They'll make garlic bread. They make salad dressings. They'll tear, you know, d- d- tear off the husk on corn and tear you know, lettuce up and things like that. Um, and the little ones love to mix and, and pour things and oftentimes make, you know, big messes. But, um, but no, it's some of my happiest time. And it's really, you know, weekends are really when we get to cook a lot as a family together just because my husband and I are, are often really busy during the week. And it's, um, I think because of that energy of the weekend too, it just feels like this most settling and, and, um, and solid foundation of our week to be in the kitchen together as a family. So hearing you talk about your diet, it's evolved to this place where, you know, you're conscious of eating healthy, but you're not super strict. You're moderate. You, you enjoy food. I'm curious, do you have any specific supplements that you take on a regular basis to complement that? Or is supplementing something you're, you're a fan of? A hundred percent. It's funny, actually, in going back to college, um, you know, they give you those like standard issue desks and bookshelves, and I converted mine to an apothecary. Like I had so many pill bottles and so many little tinctures and remedies and thing. I looked like a whole witch doctor set up. Um, I grew up taking supplements. My mom, when we were little would, would, we would have these things called magic drinks in the morning, which was a long, long before smoothies were cool. Or like you could go to like a sexy smoothie bar and get a pretty drink. My mom would feed us. They were like brown, green, 
because from the algae she would put in and then spirulina and stuff. It was so vile. But if you make it really cold, you can sort of suck it down. <laughs> but it was great. I mean, look, if, if nothing else, we all did really well in school. And so maybe there is some truth to uh, to being, you know, fu fueled in that way. Um, but no, I mean, I love supplements. I, I take them now, you know, I have a personalized packs that I love. Um, I, I'm definitely on the vitamin D train, just thinking it's, uh, it's great for immune boosting and, and brain development and utero and all different kinds of, um, you know, sort of interesting. I live in Florida now, so I'm lucky that I get to, my body gets to produce its own vitamin D a lot of the time, but I do like it. I, I like EFAs. I like vitamin C. Um, I like, uh, I take a probiotic pretty much daily, um, or try to eat yogurt but I think our, our other fermented foods. Um, but I also think it's, and, and honestly, fiber, fiber is one of the things that like, I will always throw in my smoothies because I think even, even as healthy and like, you know, vegetable dense and, and legume dense as my diet might be, we're all not, I shouldn't say all, many of us are fiber deficient. And I think it's one of those things that I, that I, um, and, you know, just working in small ways, you can have a little chia seed, a little, or, you know, a flax seed, or even some psyllium husk, just throw them into your smoothie. You barely notice they're there, but it's one of those things that makes it more filling, which is also great. Got to have lots of water when you take your fiber, but, um, this is the end of my fiber commercial. It's one of those things that I enjoy. <laughs> You mentioned quickly there the transition to Florida, and this is a relatively new move for you and your family. You guys moved during the pandemic. Talk about what that was like going from New York City to a warmer climate and how that's changed things. Well, we actually moved down to Florida originally at the end of 2017. I just had my third and I was staring down the barrel of being trapped in a Manhattan apartment in the dead of winter with a newborn and two toddlers. And I just thought, why would I do this to myself? <laughs> so um, we packed up, we came down here and we loved it so much. We ended up staying a year and a half. We moved back to New Jersey um, actually. So my kids could, could go to school there. And I, uh, we were there for the better part of a, almost a year. No, well, whatever, nine months when the pandemic was, you know, this was the, this was fall of 2019. Then the pandemic hit. And as soon as we possibly could, as soon as the country opened up, um, we flew down to Florida and, and started looking for a house down here. Um, look, it's with kids this age, outside is like an extra set of hands. It's a whole other babysitter just to be, and, and even just like mood regulation wise, I feel like if everyone's going psycho and is trapped in the house and going wild, I like send everyone outside. We all walk to the beach or we all just like sit on the grass. And suddenly there is a total reset of, just regulation. Um, and I, yeah, I have to say the, the friends that we've made down here have been phenomenal. I mean, look, we, we lived in Manhattan for the better part of 12 years. We love our, our, our family being so close to us up there, um, in Pennsylvania and Delaware and thereabouts. And I, and being surrounded by friends that we've had since college and before, and like the friends who we've made our family for sure. And I still get to ba go back to New York often enough that I feel like I get my New York fix, which is great because, you know, certainly from food standpoints, like nothing beats the New York culinary scene. I love seeing you know, people that I love up there, but then I get back down here and it feels like you can breathe. Um, I, I played tennis this morning. Like, you know, there's just like little things where you're kind of like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, why don't, why, why did it take me this long to make this move? You mentioned making new friends and for people our age and older, it can be really challenging, you know, just whether somebody's moving or not to make new connections and, and especially as we transition in life and, and take on, you know, new interests, maybe for somebody listening or tuning in right now, you know, they're becoming more interested in living healthy and, and they're looking to connect with people that are living that lifestyle. So as somebody who's been through it, talk about how people can go about connecting with others and making new friends. I think that is such an important topic that I don't know if it gets discussed enough as, as an adult about the value of positive influence in your life and the importance of connection and relationships that you feel deeply fulfilled by um, and, and how hard it can be as a, as a grown up to, you know, put yourself out there or insert yourself into a new community. Um, 
I, I was, when we first moved down, you know, it was lucky that it was pre pandemic because we made a lot of our friends through school. Like the school just did a really nice job of, of bringing in the new families and helping introduce you around and your kids make friends. And then you sort of make friends with their parents and meet people that way, which I think is phenomenal. One of the things we really desperately missed about being down in Florida when we'd gone back up North was the fact that where we live has such a like small town mentality with big town amenity, which is a really nice dichotomy to split. Um, but it's a, you know, like my kids ride their scooter up and, and we ride them to the, to the beach. Like we know every, you know, at, le- at least five people, every time we go to the coffee shop, you don't, you never feel like you're not, you know, a, a minute away from meeting a friend or seeing someone, you know, you know, and, and I think that that is a, you know, being, being, I I hadn't had that small town sort of feeling before. So that was a really interesting thing. And meeting kids, meeting friends through uh, school was really important. But then, yeah, like you said, you know, wanting to be healthy, wanting to start a new habit, like a huge way that I bonded with some of my closest girlfriends down here was we would work out together pretty much every day. We would like, we would, we would pick up at each other's houses and do a video together. Or, you know, luckily one of my friends is actually a a workout queen and, um, you know, trained in lots of different modalities there. So she would lead us along or we, you know, stream where it's obviously in the pandemic, all these amazing workouts became streaming workouts, but just like having that camaraderie and people who would show up for you and show up with you and remind you that things were happening or egg you on, you know, to, to try it once more, that kind of thing was really powerful. I mentioned I played tennis this morning. That has been a lot of fun to get to feel like that little bit of my competitive bone. Oh, you know, I played competitive sports all through high school and then dropped, uh, dropped the ball on that. <laughs> when I went, went to college, it got busy, you know, starting my career and everything. Um, but it's been fun to get back to that when I can. And I think, you know, weirdly, something that I've ended up spending a lot of time talking about that I had never set out as like a, a, a fundamental tenet of what I do but people have asked me a lot about it, um, is confidence. You know, how do you cultivate confidence in a way that lets you attract the kind of people into your life that you want there? And I think, you know, going all the way back to dorm room diet days, and I mentioned, you know, speaking in auditoriums full of my peers and having to get over that social anxiety, understandably being the overweight kid in a family full of health nuts originally felt like it was going to be my cross to bear. It felt like it was going to be something I would always feel uncomfortable about or anxious over. And going through that experience actually ended up giving me not just a platform to launch everything else that I've done from, but also a filter and a lens of like what being authentic about an experience, the kind of community you can grow from that. And the, and showed me, I mean, really viscerally showed me that when you are vulnerable, you actually do attract people that are, you know, are, that are, that are growing through something similar and want to be a part of the the process with you. And when you learn from something that you've gone through and come out the other side of stronger, it, it, confidence is just having done something before, like feeling like you can do it again because you've done it before. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you kind of rip the bandaid off and then keep plugging along. And, and it's amazing the kind of people you attract when you're coming from a place of wholeness. That is such a attractive thing when people don't feel like you're sucking something from them or you need something from them. But, but to the point of being vulnerable together, when you're going through a process together, it's actually even more empowering, even more bonding to people. Um, but again, you're not doing it from a, a take standpoint, you're doing it from a give of yourself and go through it together. And I think that that's a, 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 an incredible mindset to remember when you are feeling uncomfortable. I think we doubt ourselves or we, you know, we feel like we're the imposter. We feel like we're the anxious one or the self-conscious one or whatever. Everybody feels that way, you know? And I, I, I just, I try to remind myself of that (laughs) if ever it's getting the better of me. Well, I really like that point about the vulnerability and forming deeper connections with people. And for you, Daphne, you have this extra layer because, you know, I think this works even in small groups, you know, friends and family and being open to share and, and, you know, reciprocal sharing back and forth. But for you, you're somebody who's in the public eye and and has written these books and done so many different things out in the public where you shared your journey and, and allowed strangers, at least initially, to connect with that vulnerability in that story. So an extra layer there. I think 
so. Um, I mean, look, I think everyone who's on social media now in some ways has that same experience. You know, people, unless you're very rigid about like only when people you genuinely know in real life, like be a part of your community online. Um, but everybody sort of is open to outside influence and open to outside scrutiny and outside support, you know, two sides of that same coin. I, you mentioned something in the beginning of that question that I, I was reminded to reference, like, I grew up in a huge and very close knit family, which I think gave me this initial foundation of confidence of like my place in the world and like the people most dear and important to me. And I think that that is a big piece of, um, of why, you know, having gone through the experience that I did as a young kid, where you hear all these horror stories of, of people being bullied and made to feel bad and all these things that I, I weirdly, that was not part of my experience, which I'm very grateful for. And I, and I think a lot of that, that sort of initial strength and comfort, even, you know, in my own skin, um, was, was a bit, was largely due to just feeling like I had this inborn community that I, that I, um, never had to, uh, question. But I think going into social media, especially when I did, which was really at the dawn of the platforms, um, you know, my, my class at Princeton got Facebook the second year it was available. Um, although I don't think I joined until like senior year, I feel like I really, really resisted the the call there. Um, and we got Instagram, you know, all together, but, but when I was probably, I think I, I think I joined Instagram when I started the chew and it was in 2011 and I was 24 years old. And I will say that going through the experience of cultivating an online community and learning how to like be yourself online, um, was not always met with a lot of lot of joy in those first few years. I I feel like that was the time when there were all these. I mean, there still are plenty of them. I just have weeded them out of my personal online existence as much as I can. But there there were those keyboard warriors who were like, and they would watch the show and just send me all kinds of nastiness all the time. I mean, you have to remember, I was twenty four. My next the the co host closest in age to me, I think, was twenty years my senior. These were people who had all had rich, incredible careers on TV and in food or both. Um, they were, you know, just grounded adults in a lot of ways. They knew who they were. And I was this, even having gone through what I'd gone through and feeling stronger in my skin and, and more confident in my skin, I was vulnerable and 24 and hadn't really lived a life. And then here I was on this show in a, in a funny way, trying to like, just trying to, I was like the one straddling this weird thing where on the one hand, the show's super fun and it's hanging out with friends at the party in the kitchen and we have all this delicious food. And then here's Daphne, who also, in addition to being happy and fun and woohoo, is going to tell you that like quinoa, like let's have some kale. You know, I was very much the, the health cheerleader on this show, which again, going back to our conversation earlier about how things that feel like a cross to bear can oftentimes become the thing that makes you valuable and makes you like, gives you a perspective that other people don't have. It was in that world that I realized this really is me. I am the one, I mean, I'll say it about myself and we can have other people verify. I am the one that wants to be really fun and hang out and like relax and have a party in the kitchen. And I'm also the one that has a priority on wellness. That's not obsessive and it's not didactic and it's not restrictive, but it's here. And it has been that marriage that has really formulated like the platform that I have now, the discussion points that I have now, the comfort I have now in being those two things um, was going through it at that time. But it was not helped by the, or maybe it was helped by the people who were so nasty, who I had to get really comfortable with not pleasing. Like it was, I had to get really comfortable with the idea that I was not going to be for everyone and that by continuing to be myself, I would gravitationally pull the people who were most likely to find benefit or joy from being a part of my life. And I didn't need to try to please all the people who fundamentally didn't want what I had to offer. So I was, I think it was all good in the end, but, but in terms of uh, like an initial sort of going through the fire moment, uh, being a part of b being in that very early part of my career at the dawn of social media was a pretty wild experience. Well, at that point when you're going through the fire and this was all new and you're just learning, how did you go about handling that in a healthy way? Was there any specific things you needed to do internally within social media? How did you get through that time? Uh, I think, I mean, look, I mentioned my co-hosts who were all, you know, all had the benefit of 
being adults before the dawn of social media and therefore realizing how how you can't ride that wave. Like you can't ride the highs of it. You can't ride the lows of it. Your real life is what matters. Um, and you know, people who don't actually know you can't really have opinions on you. They can have opinions on the persona that they see of you online, but they don't know what you're like in real life. They don't know what you, what you bring to the table, what you offer, how you are with your friends, how you are with your family. Um, so it, I think I, I think I was grounded a lot by being with lots of adults at that time um, who weren't taking it as seriously and weren't, you know, reading all the comments and taking it to heart. Like, oh, this person thought I should have said this. And this person thought I should have cooked it this way. And this person didn't like the dress I wore and thought my hair looked dumb. And like all this stuff, like the number of, per- I mean, it's a female thing too, like where you just feel, um, for whatever reason, people feel it's more appropriate to comment on your physical appearance and, and like want you to change. And maybe that, maybe, you know, living as I did, I felt that to be true. But I think a lot of women would say that, that, um, that that's an added layer of complexity and stress that you have to navigate. And, um, yeah, I think it was just like going through the deep darkness of just like worrying that I had to be everything to everyone And realizing you can't do that. And then you start to come up the other side. And honestly, now, you know, the community that I've cultivated online is very, it's the people I wanted there. It's they're they are inspiring people. They are people who feel inspired in their own lives. They're proactive. They're positive. They're excited about their lives. They are like, or they're coming because they feel like there's something they want to learn more about to try something different in their lives. Um, you know, it's, I felt I have a lot of moms who are part of this motherhood journey with me, which I also think is just like foundational to having this incredible bond. Um, so I, I feel like it was, it was needing to figure out how to like weed out the people that I knew were always going to be the toxic elements too. I think that was really important. And Daphne, as you're growing in popularity, you're in the public eye, you also have again, talking about extra layers, you have your dad at that time who, you know, Dr. Oz is blowing up and, and I'm sure a lot of, you know, media outlets are trying to, you know, learn more about him and your family. And and there's a lot of attention on you and your family. So talk about what that extra layer was like as you're coming up. Well, people forget that my dad didn't start going on Oprah until I was a sophomore or a junior in high school. So I really grew up with Dr. Oz being an incredible cardiac surgeon, you know, performing on, uh, you know, amazing therapeutic procedures, inventing minimally invasive cardiac devices with robots. Like he was Dr. Oz, you know? And I think um, when he started doing Oprah, it was always weird because our our garage refrigerator would always have like some weird animal organ in it that he was going to fly out to Chicago and be able to show her what, you know, this is what a heart attack looks like in your heart. It was always so um so wild but it was really you know his you know watching him transition in his career from from doctor only to doctor and media personality was something that i was doing from college and 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 um and it was it was you know i think it it still it still allowed me to be like pretty anonymous and and in my own world and then when i got to uh you know when i got on the chew it was a it, yeah, it was, it was like a novelty. I don't think there'd ever been, maybe there has been, I, not that I knew of, um, you know, a father and daughter on the air at the same time doing an informative talk show at the same time. Um, and it was really cool. It was, I think it was great. I think people could see, you know, my dad and me and some things and then they, and it's just fun to get to like see two people from the same family and, and how they are. But I also think a lot of people didn't know that I was his daughter. Like a lot, like to this day, lots of people are like, wait, what? You know? And, and I think that's, um, Look, I, I'm very proud of, of, uh, you know, where I hope, where I hope, um, we continue to see the, the value of health and the value of the empowering feeling that people, viewers of his show always got that like health was in their hands and they had, they had ideas and, 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 um, and information that they could use differently to really impact their lives and create wonderful change. I think that, um, it was really exciting to see really cool. Or any of your other siblings in the entertainment industry? They've, you know, they've, uh, some of them have sort of dabbled or been interested in different features of it. Um, but, but not in any dedicated way, not the way that, that we are. 
Well, it's interesting because, you know, you again, coming back to your mother and grandmother's influence, your dad was trained conventionally as as a heart surgeon. So yeah. it would be interesting to think of how different things would have played out. Like how integral do you think your grandma and your mom are to where your dad ended up on TV and talking about these different ways of looking at health that he wouldn't have been trained for in school? Absolutely. I mean, I was always shocked to learn that as part of their medical training, most doctors don't receive nutrition. Uh, you know, and that's not something that is really considered part of the of the of the surgeon's purview. Um, but I think my dad, who's just you know one of the most genuinely curious people that I know, was always really intrigued by like new things he could introduce that would give his patients better outcomes. My grandfather on my mother's side, so my, both of my grandfathers were also surgeons. My father's father passed away and he was a pulmonary surgeon. My mom's dad is alive and he was a cardiac surgeon also. And um, he was a, called the rock doc because he would actually play music in the OR. And it, it, like it created such an incredible upshift of like, people's recovery and and their you know just their like alertness when they came out of surgery it was crazy how much this little sort of addition to the environment again humans are a hum I, I think just being able to treat the whole human is always something that um that my dad was very inspired by and had seen examples of like what that could create around him. Um, and I think, you know, he, he's said this many times before. My mom is actually was an actress and um, is a producer. And so she was the one who first had the idea for his first show, which was called second opinion. And, um, and, you know, was integral to the Dr. Oz show's creation and just understanding, you know, what value could be provided and who they were speaking to and how to speak to someone about health in a way that felt so digestible, no pun intended, and just like useful, um, but still entertaining and fun. Uh, and, and yeah, a hundred percent. It's, it's always been a family effort of, um, of really making the best, you know, in that world, the best TV possible of, uh, uh of really sort of creating that intersection of entertainment and education, um, in such a lasting way. Let's talk about your transition into motherhood. Earlier, we were talking about the kids, getting them in the kitchen, and and being a mom has really been a big part of your message and your brand. You had a podcast before, Mom Brain. I know that's not something you're doing currently, but talk about how life changed when you became a mom, and before becoming a mom, did you realize how this was going to become such a passion of yours to educate in this area and to to learn and take it on in such a way? I always joked growing up, um, my mom's one of six and I always joked growing up that I wanted seven kids. Um, and, uh, and I, so I, I definitely always felt called to, and I mean, I'm the oldest of four and, and because my mom was 22 when she had me and I feel like we really grew up together and then she had babies every four years. I really was this like second mother. Um, I feel like I've always been the mother hen in my friend group. It's just sort of something that I, maybe because I'm bossy and I like to make the decisions, but, um, but either way it is what it is. Uh, and it's, uh, it, for, for that reason, I always felt like, you know, I wanted to have a big family. I wanted, you know, lots of, lots of little feet running around and noise and memories and traditions and the things that I, you know, anytime we get together with my grandparents and my mom's siblings, it's like, it, it could be Christmas every day because it's just like a huge group of people and everyone's eating you know, just by volume. You're eating like a feast. And it's just it's just um, that was something so critical to what how I felt my adult life was going to go. And I could not have known. I mean, I had Philomena in 2014, um, my oldest, and I I felt like you know, the first couple months, maybe you're, you don't feel like an expert. You don't feel like you have anything valuable to share. You're just like learning and trying to survive. You know, And I think again, you know, doing that piece of it on social media, you start to gravitate people or, you know, pull in people who are either in that similar stage of life or just about to give birth or moms for many years who have great, you know, things to share. And, and it, it sort of in that way, I started to see that like this unifying element it takes over your life. I I always think, you know, your version 1.0 of yourself pre-kids and then every child you have thereafter is version 2.0 and 3.0 and 4. You just, you have to shift because there's less and less time for 
the things that you would have done before. And that doesn't mean you lose that love. This is something that I, um, I feel like I've talked about a bit because it's really important to me that, I, and I've seen this modeled in my mom, my grandma, that as a mom, I don't lose sight of who I am, that I don't lose sight of the passions that I have. A lot of things get reprioritized. A lot of things there aren't time for in this moment, but it doesn't, but the things that I do make time for are still really powerful and important to me. They help me feel filled up. So I have more to give. They help me feel like a whole person. Um, and they, and they make, I, I think treating the woman is important as much as treating the mother. And I think, um, in that way, you know, part of how I've sort of dialogued about motherhood has always been like, here are things that have worked for me. Here's a way that I've, you know, tackled picky eaters or a way that I get my kids to have fun in the kitchen with me, or, you know, my kids were having a meltdown and here's what I did. Um, or like my kids were fighting and here's what, here's how we resolved it. Um, and at the same time to always also weave in like, I see you, you know, I, I, I feel what you're going through as a mom and here's what I would do in that situation. Or here's how I've made time for me in this moment. Or here how, here's, you know, I was feeling like not the best version of motherhood because I was stressed and exhausted and felt like I was snapping and, and here's what I did to course correct. So like really trying to keep in mind the woman and separate from the mother. Um, and I think that that's a, a, not that it's like, you know, earth shattering, but I think it's not always sort of framed that way. Um, which is, I, look, I'm, and I, body positivity, a, a huge piece of what I talk about, because I think a lot of women who follow me are like, oh, your body looks like my body. Like I can see what you're wearing and feel inspired to put that on because I see what it would look like in my life. And I think that's a really cool thing too, just to like, you know, when I, when I don't hide from my life, in some small way, I think it gives the women who are part of my world online, like permission to do the same. And I, I think that that's, look, sometimes we're like faking it till we make it, but we can do that together too. You quickly touched on there, filling yourself up, not losing yourself as you become a mom. Let's talk about some of the specific things you do to fill up that have worked for you. Again, it's going to be different for everybody. Yes. But yeah. what are some ideas that have that have been helpful for you and, and things that you're still implementing to keep yourself energized and, and fueled up? So something I realized, and this is just top of mind because it's something I've been grappling with myself, is that I hadn't pleasure read for myself in like literal years. And I think, um, you know, just going through child... You know, newborn stage, pregnant, newborn stage. So in such close succession, I just had never gotten like 20 minutes to lie in my bed and read. Um, or if I had those 20 minutes, I would choose to do something maybe like a little bit mentally lazier, like, like, you know, just watch something or scroll something. And it was making me feel depleted that like I hadn't felt and like I was in this, you know, I you spent you spent a lifetime learning. You know, I I was in school, then college, then I went and studied nutrition at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. I went to gourmet, the Natural Gourmet Institute and got my culinary degree. Like you're in this lifetime of learning, and then you know you're learning on the job all the time as a mom. But I felt like you know sometimes when you're learning in the moment and going through it, and as you're learning, you're not able to focus on other things. And I I wanted some kind of just like sometimes I wanted just like a fun fiction to breathe into. And sometimes I wanted, you know, I was thinking through some, you know, some parenting thing quandary and I wanted outside intelligence to share with. Um, and I, I will say that, you know, committing to 10 minutes of reading a day has actually been really helpful. Uh, or, you know, I listen to podcasts and audible like books on tape when I drive and, and that's really helpful too. Um, other ways I feel filled up. I, you know, I really, I really try not to view self-care as like an afterthought or a nice to have. I, and with that intention, I end up putting, you know, 15 minutes at the end. I put it in my calendar at the end of every day to actually do your skincare routine, have a bath. If you'd like to have that lie with, this is something I started doing um, years ago. And it is so cool. If you lie with your feet propped up on the wall, just put a pillow behind your neck and, um, and lie with your feet propped up at like a 90 degree angle. It's so good for, for, um, circulation. It's good for detoxing. It makes you feel so relaxed and you can lie down there and listen to your book on tape. And it's just kind of lovely. Um, I'm, you know, obviously being in Florida is one of those things where we're outside a lot. And even just honestly, after this, in I, after our talk, I have another, um, interview coming up. I'm going to take 10 minutes and walk outside and, and walk my puppy who's yelling at me. Like, I don't know if you can hear him, but he's yelling at me. 
me like, cause he can hear me talking and he wants me to let him into this room. Um, and so I mean, even just little, you know, 10 minutes to stretch your legs, have that circuit. I mean, you like, going back to the whole, you know, health begets confidence, begets approaching your life differently, begets a different outcome, begets a happier, you know, like the whole thing is all flowing into each other. And I sometimes just find if I'm feeling stagnant or uninspired or uncreative, if I walk outside for 10 minutes and the blood starts to flow, it just like everything shifts up, which is lovely. What about meditation? Are you into (laughs) meditation? Okay. So you've hit on the two critical health trends that I I'm really bad at. Number one, intermittent fasting. Number two is meditation. Not for lack of trying. I actually went to a transcendental meditation course. I got my mantra. And it's, again, one of those things where, you know, when I have the time to do it, I, I need to get better at making the time for it because it's a, I find it's a hard thing to like squeeze into the middle of the day. And I, um, one thing that I've started doing at nighttime as part of that like self-care routine that's not a nice to have, it's a scheduled item, is writing... Um, is writing a list of the things I know I have to tackle the next day in order of priority just to get that out of my brain. So I'm not on this constant loop and, and by virtue of strat strategically having a game plan for the next day, I feel like I have a more creative headspace, like as I fade into night and sleep and things. Um, but it's not the same as meditation. And I, people, I mean, it feels like an unfair advantage. People who meditate are like, oh, you know, I like, I am so creative. I have three business ideas a day and I have, you know, this much mental clarity and this much energy and it, we should all be doing it. And I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm really working on that. Well, I feel like there's two different ways to look at meditation. You know, there's meditation where you're maybe lying in bed and, and listening to a guided meditation at the end of the day, Or you talked about going with your dog in between interviews, you know, being present to the feeling of the sun on your skin and watching your dog and the feeling of your feet if you're, you know, on the on the beach, uh, on the sand. So I think there's there's getting present with whatever's in front of you throughout the day. And that's also very beneficial and, and part of it, too. I think that's so powerful and so true and goes back to just paying attention. I mean, that was you know, you asked about the the biggest sort of shift in my health in college when I was writing your room diet. And the biggest shift was just paying attention. Am I eating now because I'm actually hungry or am I eating because it's like the love and the fun and the connection that I'm craving, that, which is what I grew up with. You know, food was this incredible bonder and this unifier and food equaled love. And so it became hard to separate like eating for fuel versus eating for that emotional purpose. Um, but paying attention really dialed me into that. And I think the same is true here. When you, when you savor any experience, it means so much more and it fuels you in such a different way. And I'm glad to hear you say that because it makes me feel like I can work it in, in a way that isn't like quiet the mind, steal your body. Like I just, it's hard for, it's hard for me to do that. (laughs) Mom life, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Well, you talked about there, and I'm curious about how you manage your life a little bit more. You got into the fact that you write things down before you go to bed, make a list. I think that serves multiple purposes. One, Mm -hmm. just allowing you, you mentioned dumping your brain and and getting into that sleep state. But two, just having a plan for the next day. Yes. I mean, Daphne, you live a lifestyle outside of kids and a family that would be busy for most people. And you have four young kids. So, so... (laughs) You're you're definitely whether you give yourself credit for or not, you're an expert in managing time and and planning out and and you know, it might not be again mom life, it might not be what we see on Instagram or whatnot, but you have a system. So let's talk about how you make all that work and run. Oh my gosh, I'm going to need to like clip that part of your audio and just replay it for myself over and over. I um I will say and I think this is, I think, um, for me personally, maybe it's the Aquarius and me, maybe this is everyone you, you feel like you're going to be more relaxed or more, um, like creative and free flowing and whatever. If you don't plan, if you just like, see what it happens. And like, you know, I want a free day. I want to just like have no obligations and see what happens. And the, and the funny thing is actually you feel so much more relaxed you feel so much more capable to tackle whatever is on in your day when you have a plan, which took me a long time to recognize. And I would always stress me and I'd be like, I don't want to have to put all these restrictions and these, you know, these things around my day. And it just makes me feel like 
crazy and claustrophobic. And the reality is when I have some more uh, structure, it is, it is night and day. I, a couple of things that I have really worked for me that I'll share in no particular priority. Number one is making a game plan for the following day. Um, you know, strategically, just like when you wake up and your first thought isn't scattered, it isn't like, what do I have to do today? You actually have a plan. You're just already primed for a feeling of effectiveness. And again, so much, all of us, we are mind over matter first. Like your, your mind has to be your biggest ally in tackling anything in your life. And I think when you, when you prep it to feel uh, in control, it, it actually works that much better for you. Working out first thing in the morning, a hundred percent, something that I feel changes my hormones, changes my like endorphin stream and just makes me feel good. It makes me feel effective first thing in the morning. Again, this whole mindset of effectiveness, efficiency, uh, capability, showing up for myself, showing up for other people, like all of that starts in those first couple hours of the day. A girlfriend of mine recently said to me, output before input, and especially if you're in a creative um, world at all, those first probably 10, 15 minutes when you wake up are some of your most fluid and creative and you're tapped into subconscious and this whole thing. And like most of us grab our phone or like Instagram, you know, I mean, that you have that first influx before you've put anything out and it totally robs you of this this blank space that's actually, you can use it for a lot of good. And a lot of people journal in that time. That's what she was just, you know, she was sharing with me and I, I, I keep meaning to start that, but at least I just sort of like have 10 minutes of blank headspace for myself before I run into the rest of my day. Um, I, and I find that it, you know, again, because I'm not worrying about all the things I have to do, cause I already have a game plan. I can actually like really release into that time. Um, uh, my grandmother, from whom I've gotten so much great life advice, one of her, she's really big into the Stoics right now. And one of the pieces of wisdom she shared from them was be ruthless with the things that do not matter. And I think that's, you know, you mentioned I, I have a couple different careers in addition to really wanting to be the kind of mother I want to be. And I, um, I found there were definitely points in my life where I felt so stretched thin and look, life comes in cycles. I definitely, I've just got, I, you know, I've just been through a 10 week spurt of like traveling every week, being in New York for filming the good dish, uh, you know, just gearing up for book tour. Like we're doing a lot right now. And I recognize that there are going to be periods where my balance doesn't feel totally on kilter. Um, but recognizing that on, you know, in this sort of status quo in my life, there were lots of things that were making me feel drained that like I didn't need to participate in. And it made me feel socially awkward sometimes or like self-conscious sometimes to say no or, or, you know, bow out of things, but being able to really then have the headspace and the energy to pour myself into the things that did matter has made me feel in that way, even if you don't get to everything on your to-do list, which I frequently don't, the things that you have done are the things that matter. And the things that you haven't gotten to weren't left by the wayside because you wasted time doing things that didn't matter. You know, that's just a few of the things. <laughs> Let's talk about how your husband, John, fits into this whole picture. You're you're married, you know, again, you got four kids. How do you guys go about working as a team to facilitate? And again, it's not always perfectly smooth, but how do you guys work together to make things run as smoothly as, as possible? I mean, John is none of this would be possible without John, not the least because he is such an incredible father and such an incredible husband. And so he just like naturally is kind of clued into what's needed at any given time. But also I think, you know, like any good relationship, you invest in it. People sometimes I think get this misguided notion of like your, you know, your marriage is a, um, is like a rock, you know, people talk about that. Your marriage is a rock. Well, no, your marriage is a plant. Like it's solid. It has deep roots. It has, you know, ability to last forever, but not if you don't feed it and not if you don't let it see sun and not if you don't like let it rain once in a while. Like it, it feels, um, like a, it is a living, breathing thing that you always have to prioritize and, and be aware of the other person who is meeting you, you know, sometimes halfway, sometimes more than halfway, sometimes the other way, you know, other direction. And I think we um, feel really lucky that like we have the kind of communication that we do that um, 
I am not, uh, I don't, I don't mince words. <laughs> and then I think I mean, neither does he. And I think that's really like, I, I, I don't, I'm not afraid of that. I actually really prefer that of, um, you know, to be really loving with each other and be really open with each other. Uh, I think are, are, are a big foundational piece of, of also creating our marriage to be the foundation of our happy family. And, and, um, you know, look, when you're in young childhood, early childhood phase of parenting, the kids will take up all your time and then some. They are greedy little sponges for every ounce of effort and thoughtfulness and creativity and fun and planning. Someone said to me, they were like, the holiday magic is literally just a concerned parent, like making that happen for their children. And it's so true. Um, but you know, you can't forget about your partner in crime in that, even in those life stages. And I think, you know, being open with each other about, um, about what we need in any given moment has been really, really fundamental. And you mentioned there how a relationship needs to be nurtured and well taken care of. Do you guys have specific like days or a day during the week that you make sure you you spend together and have alone time, like go for a dinner together? Because again, you talked about how, especially in the in the early days with young kids, like time is of the essence. And it's so easy to you know, put that off and just say, okay, we're busy right now. We'll, we'll have time for date night later on or whatnot. But I think it is important to whatever capability you have at that time in that evolution of the family to make that time for each other. So has that been something you guys have done? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, we don't have a specific night that we use for that. Um, you know, our schedules change so much that that's not something that would work for us, but I think, um, you know, I mean, I mean, when you were talking, I was even thinking back to like newborn days, newborn, newborn days, and you're so fried and you're so just like hormonal and everything's crazy. And we, I, we were living in New York when I first had, you know, when we had our first, and I remember ordering like Thai food and I was so spent. It was probably like eight 30 or nine. She'd just gone down and, and we sat on the couch and ate this Thai food together. And that 20 minute period or half an hour period just felt so connective and rewarding. And like my person is here just like letting me feel supported at this time when I'm, I feel like I'm giving everything I have to give to our baby. And I, um, I, I, it just, I, it's funny that just like kind of came into my brain as you were talking. Cause I do think we put, look, love doing something fancy, love doing something hole in the wall, love, you know, I, I really, I think, especially when you get really busy, the most important thing to feel is that you're looking for moments of joy and that you're not robbing joy from yourself. And you're not like, you're not waiting to have a really great date night. You're taking 15 minutes to have a rice cake and some almond butter together. And like, and like, that's okay for now. You know, if that's what you have time for, for right now, it works. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that was <laughs> just like, obviously, clearly our connective point is also like in my mind, you know, we, we go for a walk together, which we are so lucky to get to do now that we have beautiful weather, you know, most days of the year. Um, and we'll have a, you know, have a quick meal together or go out together or, you know, have a dinner party together. Like now we're getting, our youngest is two and a half. She'll be three in August. Now we're getting to a more, like, at least we're sleeping through the night now for the most part, which is lovely. Um, so I feel like we're capable of a lot of things that, you know, there were years when we just didn't do. Um, and that's okay. I think every, phase of your parenting and every phase of your marriage has elevations and, and things that are different and you have time for more than you don't. And, um, and we're just trying to make sure that we, like, like I said, savor those moments of joy whenever they are apparent. And I love how your examples there, you took, you know, everyday things and made those the highlight to celebrate together because it doesn't need to be these big celebratory things, which can be nice from time to time, but Wonderful, it's all about yeah. having quality time and making sure the other person realizes that they're a priority and, and you're, you're spending that time together and connecting. Absolutely. I mean, you, th and that's something that I forget, maybe I think my mom actually probably gave me some relationship advice early on just about realizing that like, realizing that people aren't mind readers as much as my husband comes very close, um, that you can set people up for success by letting them know what you need and what you want and like, and you're giving them a helping hand, um, that will ultimately also help you. But I also think just, just that, like you just mentioned, making people feel like a priority, 
that's how you want to feel. You know, that's how you wish someone would think of you. That's how you would like to be elevated and treated, not as an afterthought, but as someone's priority. Um, and that someone respects and values you is, is it cannot be undersold. Earlier, you touched on picky eaters. And again, as a mom of four, you've been through this a lot of times, and I'm sure I have a lot of experience <laughs> with a lot of these, these quote unquote mom challenges. So mm -hmm. let's talk about a couple of them here, starting with picky eaters. What are some of the things you found work when kids just, you know, you, you maybe we talked about again, coming back to working together in the kitchen. I would guess that's helpful, getting the kids involved in making that meal. Yeah. But what are some other things to do when they just won't eat these, these, these healthy, delicious meals that you're putting together? I will say there is, you know, parenting is humbling on so many levels, but I, I will never forget, like in my line of work and what I love, you know, feeling like I've got this parenting thing on lock. My kid is perfect. She eats everything with my first, you know, I, until she was two, my daughter Philomena ate spinach, lentils, sweet potato, fish, you know, whatever, like anything I put in front of her, she was like, Ooh, this is wonderful. At like what felt like two on the dot, she suddenly became a person and she suddenly was like, meh. I hate fruit. I will never put another piece of fruit in my mouth. I don't believe in, uh, you know, tomatoes, <laughs> like, you know, just random things that she came up with that suddenly became a, a non-entity for her. And every single one of my children has those things, has like the one thing they won't eat, the one thing that they don't like, that the moment in time where they decide that something that they've lived on for years is suddenly like the worst thing they've ever put in their mouth. Um, the way that I tackle picky eating Another piece of advice from my grandmother who has six kids, she said, don't make your kids resist you more than the food. And I do think mealtime is a real stressor. It's a real battle for a lot of parents, especially if you're like well-informed about, you know, what do I need, what do I need to be giving my kids to help them thrive and brain development and body development and all the rest. And it stresses you out when like the only thing they'll eat is cereal out of a box or uh, chicken nuggets. And I think, um, Obviously, even within the realm of those like constrictions, you can still do it better. You can still have like a healthier chicken nugget. You can have a cereal that has fiber in it. This is the fiber podcast. Um, I think, you know, I think that there's a way to, there's a way to navigate even the most narrow of, of picky eaters. But something that my grandmother in, the, in sharing that did for me was like, it's not ego versus ego. It's in, and you act, you know, the way that you get more flies with honey than vinegar, like drawing kids in to feel like they're making adult choices when you get them to eat healthy foods, as opposed to from a top down directive being like, you must listen to me because I'm the one in charge, which feels, which feels very limiting and very like unattractive to kids as they start to form their, you know, their, their, their own preferences and things of that nature. So what I oftentimes will do is just put out a variety, not too many, because too many choices always begets misery, but a variety of foods in the middle of the table. And my kids are allowed, my two-year-old, I help, but like my kids are allowed to, to serve themselves. And that they have to take something of everything. We have a rule that big kids try everything once, but the portion amount that they take of each thing they have control over. And I don't force them beyond that one bite. And really, really, that is just my like gateway of exposing them to foods over and over. So they start to develop a taste for it, making sure they aren't afraid of foods, which I think, you know, that sort of is something that I always wanted to avoid. Um, and also having them see that like, this is how our family eats. So choosing to be a part of the experience in this way and being a big kid and trying everything once and being experimental with your food, this is a grown up thing. That's also a communal thing which are two very uh, motivating factors of, of, of childhood development. Um, so that's been very helpful for me. And then finding ways to work in healthy items into things I know they already love. So when I put pureed uh, roasted butternut squash into my mac and cheese, or when I make chicken nuggets, but I make it with you know, whole chicken breast that I slice up and then put, uh, you know, a, like a, a nice breadcrumb on that sometimes I'll do ground flax seeds in and ground nuts in instead of the breadcrumbs or I'll, or I'll like just doctor up the breadcrumbs themselves. Um, I think even just having those little bonuses to foods they're already easily made to eat um, has been helpful. And, and like you said, getting them in the kitchen, getting them in the kitchen is the biggest thing. Cause then they feel, I'm getting them food shopping with you. Cause then they feel like they help make the choice. So they're less scared of it when it shows up on their plate. 
I love how you open that up talking about, you know, that level of confidence with the first kid or maybe first couple kids, because oh I can yes. relate to that as well. I have two young ones at home and, you know, you feel like, OK, I got this down. This works. But one thing you learn early on as a parent, or at least we have, is that, you know, when you think you have it down, things can totally flip on you overnight. Oh so you, you need to be humble. And you need to realize that that it's an evolution and not a stagnant um, success story. Yes, totally. What are some of the other things, because you do have this large audience and, and this message of, of helping moms through motherhood, what are some of the other things that you find moms are often getting stuck on and, and ways you've been able to help them navigate that? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of motherhood that feels very unglamorous. <laughs> Poop explosions and the like. Um, and I think going back to that conversation about seeing the whole woman and her motherhood as a feature of that, um, that's something that, again, I, I, not intentionally, but just because they were, look, a lot of the books I write, a lot of what I do is what I need in my life and haven't been able to find. And, um, you know, when I look for ways to put makeup on or do my hair or get dressed in a certain way that makes me feel feminine and elegant and glamorous and whatever like thing and they're not big things they're they're just like little choices that I have made that have made me feel better in that part of my life and I'll share about those things and it it's amazing to me how I mean, like yes I'm known for food and, and cooking and wellness but when I put up a makeup tutorial video they're the ones that are just like crazy high views because I'm a real person putting on makeup I'm not trained in this like yes I've had the benefit of working with amazing makeup artists and having my makeup done over, you know, over time with, with my career. But, um, what I do for myself feels very doable for people at home. And like I mentioned before, I get dressed as a size eight, 10, like that is a very accessible size. Like at least, in, you know, envisioning what that would look like on your body is, is something a lot of women also relate to. And then when they see me wear it, they're like, Oh, I hadn't thought to even try that trend or try that look. And I love how it looks on you. I'm going to try it for myself. And I think that that is that like, you know, that just reminding yourself, like I said it before about the things that you used to love that used to be a part, a big part maybe of who you were that, you know, understandably take a back seat when you're deep in the trenches, um, you can reawaken and, or just like try something new that have a new shade of lipstick that feels suddenly, it, like you know, we've had this through this thread of what your mind does for you when you have it working on the same wavelength as you're, as you are, you're trying to do, um, that little bit of self-investment, I feel like it carries so much weight. I feel like it, it, you, when you show up for yourself, when you treat yourself well, uh, even when we're talking about relationships, when you prioritize yourself, that is one of the most fundamental relationships you can have. Um, and it's, it's little things like that, that I do think help I, or at least for the women who come to me for that information, they find it very helpful. Daphne, really enjoyed the conversation. Appreciate all the work you're putting out in the world, your vulnerability, you're, you're connecting with so many different women and people, and it's, it's amazing. So tell people how they can get the new book and how they can connect with you after the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I enjoyed the conversation too. I, um, yes, I'm so thank you for the opening to talk about eat your heart out. Um, it is my new cookbook and it's out in April. Um, and it's 150 recipes free from gluten and free from refined sugar. It actually documents a reset that I've used over the last five years. Um, yes, after pregnancies, but also after any, you know, anytime I need just a chance to reset my healthy habits and renew that commitment and do it in a way that feels, um, very restorative, not restrictive, uh, and, and still delicious. Fundamentally, that is the biggest commitment I am making is that like, whenever I would look at a reset program or try to, you know, figure out some, some, something to adopt into my life, it always felt like another job. It always felt like there were, there were barriers to entry that just were prohibitive to the way that I live my life. And so I wrote the reset that I wish had existed, um, in eat your heart out. And the title I hope shows that my commitment is to 
the fact that you will want to eat everything in this book, which is the best part. If you can forget that you're doing it to be healthy or to reset healthy habits and just do it because it's pleasurable and fun, that is like the dream world. Um, and yes, there are snack recipes and yes, there are even dessert recipes. So eat your heart out. And where else can you connect with me? I'm at Daphne Oz on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and Twitter and DaphneOz.com for all the other good stuff. You mentioned there quickly, the new book is gluten-free. What's been your relationship with gluten over the years? Purely, um, I don't have an allergy or anything like that, but I find um, I, for myself personally and a lot of people that I talk to, even without any uh, you know medical underpinning to it, you just feel uh, more clear-headed, more energetic, less bloated when there's less gluten in your diet. And I still make plenty of room for gluten in places where it matters, but this book was really, and the recipes I include in this book are really all the, you know, a, a, a selection of the ways that I like to have gluten-free recipes where you're not missing the gluten. You know, I'm not, I'm not reinventing the bagel. If you're going to eat a bagel, you should have some gluten with it, but um, if you can, but I, um, but I, and, and that said, I will say that like nowadays there's so many great gluten-free alternatives, which are really helpful for people who have celiacs or have a gluten intolerance. But as part of the reset, I wanted to avoid overly processed things. So I really avoided things that like should have gluten, quote unquote, but have it had it removed. Um, and, and it was, again, like I, I mentioned earlier on, I end up writing these books because they, I, I have a need that I can't meet based on what's currently existing in the marketplace. And then I end up creating, you know, once I've trial and errored it and had it work in my own life, I want to create the resource to share what I've learned. And, um, the no gluten feature of this book was was purely because when I was experimenting with eating methodologies, especially after babies or in times when I was like really stressed out or really celebrating and feel like I totally let my healthy habits and commitments go, foods with gluten in them and foods with sugar in them are the ones that are very easy for me to overeat. And they come with things that are very easy for me to overeat. So it, sometimes it's just a matter of nipping in the bud what you know creates a, a problem. Um, and one feature I didn't mention about Eat Your Heart Out is it's five days on, two days off. And this, I hope people who've heard listened to this conversation will appreciate how real this is to my life. I am someone who enjoys life through food. I, enjoy, I adventure through food. I like fill my memory bank through food. So I was not happy to be on quote unquote, a program that felt either a, like a departure from how I normally wanted to live too, too radically or B robbed me of the joy I find in food by making it all like numbers and calculations and like quantities and things. But also that I, kn I knew for myself, I needed to understand like a time contain, like, I, like there was five days down the road, I was going to get I, w I could create a time in my week to have those indulgent moments that I really craved. So it's five days on of this no gluten, no refined sugar program, and then two days off every week where you can eat whatever you want and have fun and like savor those moments. And it mentally, it also is one of those things where like anybody can do anything for five days. So it really just contains it in a beautiful way, it makes it very flexible and functional for the average life and, um, and helps you feel really good. It really works. That's the whole point. It feels good to eat your heart out. <laughs> we keep coming back to this theme of moderation. I'm curious along your journey, Daphne, did you ever have any periods of time where you went extreme? and then found your way back to moderation? Or has that just been a theme for you throughout to, to be more moderate? I think I'm just a, generally speaking, a more moderate person. I like to have flexibility um, because I knew that if I went too extreme, it was never, it was never going to last. It's just, well, there's too much good that comes from the, having balance in my life. Um, I think I was quoted at some point saying, and I stand by it, I'd rather be five pounds heavier and eat foods that I love, you know, so I, that's just my personal preference. Um, but I, but I, but you know, in a perfect world, you can have your cake and eat it too. And, and more than, you know, any specific number on the scale, it really is about like, do I feel our very first point in this conversation? Do I feel my potentials being met? Do I feel set up to succeed in all the ways that I want to succeed? Do I have the energy to take on my day? Do I feel good in my skin? Um, that's really what Eat Your Heart Out is all about. Well, we've come full circle. I'm going to let you go. Everything's <laughs> going to be linked up in the show notes. And uh, Daphne, again, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Me too. Thanks so much for having me, Jesse.